Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Welcome, wildlings. Now, you'll notice that when it comes to stories, with very few exceptions, the old folks seem to have the best ones. Well, except for me. I just steal them from those smarter and more talented at storytelling. Such as tonight's tale, What We Saw in the Mines of Appalachia, by Aaron Whit. Every old timer in Allen Creek has their own version of what happened. Hell, even half the young people think they know how it went down. But don't listen to anyone who wasn't there. It's, it's like that game we used to play as youngsters, where you take a piece of yarn tied to two cups and you pass it around a circle repeating some message. Telephone. That's what we called it. Only difference is that in Telephone, the story starts as something simple and gets more ridiculous as it goes. But this story? It gets more and more plausible the younger the teller. Almost like it's too much to be believed. So listeners correct for realism when they retell it so as not to sound crazy. My own grandson told me the other day that I remember it wrong that it were all just some tragic accident and an albino bear. <laughs> Something may write about that. Twelve-year-old kid telling his grandfather what he should and shouldn't remember. So don't listen to the young people. They weren't there. Truth is, most of us old folk weren't there neither. The way we talk, you'd guess every miner in town was caught up in it. Like how every boomer will tell you he was at Woodstock. But it was only maybe 20 of us. Of those, a uh, sight more than half are dead and buried now. Except for old Rashi Sang. That bastard had himself cremated. I'll, I'll start over. Uh, you'll forgive me if I repeat myself. Uh, 1956, like near every other young man, I worked the mines. Hard work but honest. Plus, nothing else paid as good in town. Uh, nothing I was qualified for at any rate. And I had a wife, a child, and another on the way to support. Besides, my friends were miners. Ralph Hatfield, Roshnik Sang, and Sid McNamara. We'd usually hit the bars after work, me leaving early on account of the family, and Rashi would just order juice. Now, Ralph didn't much care for the bartender. Most of us didn't. Jesse Felt tended bar not because he was especially good at it, but because he didn't have the stomach for man's work. He even hired kids to mow his lawn and do his landscaping. Wasn't ashamed of it, neither. Thought it made him smarter than the rest of us. I don't know if I ever caught Jesse in town without some fool sideways grin. Ralph suspected that Felt got his job by sleeping with the widowed bar owner. I didn't think so, but it weren't impossible. Jess had taken the first <clears throat> fruits, if you'll beg my pardon, of at least two girls in town, and had nearly half a dozen ex or current lovers. He was smooth with women, and he had a pretty face, high cheekbones, sharp nose. That was reason enough for most of us to dislike him. Ralph had more claim to hate felt than most. Y'all who ain't from West Virginia probably know of the Hatfields and the McCoys, but that's water under the bridge compared to the Hatfields and the Felts. See, during the Cold Wars, Hatfields fought for the Unions, and uh, the Felts owned the mines. But if you gave Jesse a hard time about it, he'd come back with some quip. Felt always was the funny guy. That, combined with the fact that he never got angry, kept the rest of us from truly hating him. Save Ralph, of course. June 10th was when it all started. Chicada season. They were bad that year, too. So many damn insects you could hydroplane on their guts if your tires' treads were bare. The mine was a haven from them, for the workday at least. You didn't have to listen to the never-ending screech. But this season... Even the mine was worse than the outside. 
it echoed. It didn't even pretty sounding like a cricket, at least not to me. So it's no wonder we worked deeper in than usual. We got far enough that we couldn't hear a peep and went to work. A couple of hours into the day, I spotted a neck into a new room. But this one was real narrow, as in too narrow for most folks to fit through. But Rashi, he's a skinny guy and he could damn near fit through the bars on a baby's crib. Anytime there was a crack that the rest of us were nervous to slide through, Sang had it covered. We waited around for no more than ten minutes before Rashi squeezed back towards us. I'd never seen the man so excited. Stop all the other mining, he said with his thick accent. It's a treasure room. In most mines, the demolitions expert calculates the proper amount of black powder and then everyone draws straws on who has to light the fuse. But most mines didn't employ Sid McNamara, that uh, craziest son of a bitch I ever knew. Sid did all the blasting himself. He loved to be as close to the explosion as sanity and safety allowed. Most of us figured that he'd go the way of his Ireland-born grandfather and die in such a blast. But he blew that neck wide open without a vent and we all had to look for ourselves at Rosh's treasure room. What we saw was a gold mine. Well, no, it wasn't. It was a coal mine. But it was a hell of a lot of coal. Mighty easy to collect. Owner was ecstatic. He hired everyone in town not already working for him at twice the normal rate. Even Felt couldn't resist a few weeks of hard labor for that kind of cash. We worked like dogs, all week taking as many hours at double pay as possible. Predictably, Jesse was the uh, laziest of us, but we needed him to have enough energy to pour our drinks after work so no one said a thing. Now, I'm not sure who saw it. I, I want to say it was Felt who came strutting back with a proud smile to tell us all of his find. If my memory serves, and it was Felt, that's what they call cruel irony. Anyway, Felt, or whoever it was, had found yet another neck. One wide enough that anyone could walk through. New room was small, but it was filled with coal. Loose, too. That should have made us wary. Coal doesn't just sit on the surface, stacked knee-deep, ready to be scooped into bags. But we were greedy. And now we had two rooms to work. A handful of guys I barely know worked the smaller room. We called it the pirate's chest at the time. Now, I've already admitted we were greedy. We robbed pillars and we were too aggressive with the cutting machine, but that room should not have collapsed. I've been in natural collapses before. This wasn't one of them. Some of the miners will tell you that everything was quiet and normal-like right up until the cave-in, but no, there was one sound. And that sound haunts me even still. Most rational explanation is that the men in the pirate's chest shouted before the rocks gave way, but I know what I heard. It was a scream all right, but they weren't human. It wasn't a shout of anger or fear or surprise. If you ask me how I figured a demon might yawn, I'd tell you I don't have to guess. I know. That sound? That was us waking something up. Something buried under all that coal. The three or so men working the treasure room got sucked under that big pile of black like there was some giant hoover underneath. Then the collapse started. It was the big chamber went first, the one me and my buddies were working. That hallway Sid had blasted out fell in on itself without so much as a groan to warn us. Most were able to run through the corridor in time and make it out. A couple were buried under the rubble, crushed as flat as pancakes. Hooper Collins got his leg pinned under a boulder, which would be the death of him. Nineteen or twenty, I think. Got a pretty wife and no kids by her yet. Ah, death sure knows how to pick them. Anyway, when the dust cleared and I was through coughing, I noticed poor Hooper hollering and screaming. I did my damnedest to roll the rock off his femur. Hadn't finished before Ralph screamed and pointed. 
couple of new recruits had rushed into that small room to avoid the boulders. Stupid bastards. Now, the screams I heard next were definitely human. I, I didn't watch, but you can't mistake the sound of flesh being yanked apart. So I gave up on Collins and ran for the rest of the survivors. I've tried to forget how he begged me not to run. The words that he used. I failed at that. I ran. Not far, just around a corner, and soon every healthy body was huddled around the cave-in, desperately trying to dig out. It was futile, but I jumped in anyway. What else could I do? When the screams stopped, the eating began. Must have gone on for half an hour, tearing, cracking, suckling. We all knew what the entree was, and each of us dug all the faster for it. Eventually, of course, the panic wore off and we had some time to think. What was back there? More importantly, what would it do when it finished its meal? And we all knew that we hadn't made progress in escaping. West Virginians are just stubborn, I guess. As horrifying as the rending sounds were, the silence was worse. The dinner was done. Hopefully, it had been filling. Damn it! Everyone stop! We need to figure this out, screamed Sid McNamara. Irishman held up his lantern and we all faced the light. Over a dozen of us were huddled, some crying, others had shat themselves, but all of us were shaken as if naked in a blizzard. We took a break from the frantic digging and shut up for a moment. All but Rodney, the preacher's son who fell to his knees and wouldn't stop praying, no matter what the rest of us did. Ronnie wasn't half as holy as his father, but at least one of us was asking heaven for help, and that couldn't have hurt. Finally, somebody spoke. Ralph Hatfield. He'd always had a clear head, even did a couple of years of college. He kept his voice lower than Sid had what with the creature right around the corner, so we leaned in. It'll take days to dig ourselves out. That thing will get us if dehydration isn't, and it's guarding the TNT if that becomes our only option. Well, can we post a watch? Guards to make sure it don't come in here? It was Jesse what said it, trying poorly to maintain his composure. You volunteering? You'd rather stand around than dig like the rest of us, said Ralph. No, I... Most of the water and the lights are in the room with it, said Sid. We got it outnumbered. Can it die? Of course, said Ralph. I read a whole issue on undiscovered species in the National Geographic. Most life in the ocean is unknown, and there's all sorts of cave creatures we never knew about. This thing is just an animal. Animals can die. What's it eat, then? I asked. Stupid. No one responded for a minute, and then Ralph nodded. The cold. Coal's energy, too, made of carbon, just like living things. There's beasts out there that digest minerals. They call them uh, lithophiles. Now, I can't speak to the accuracy of Ralph's claims or even the exactness of my memory, but I'd like to think that Ralph was right. It was an animal. Don't know that I actually believe it, though. Around that time, Rodney stopped muttering and shouted at us. It's no animal. It's no natural thing at all. Shut up, man, hissed Sid through his teeth. It's a demon, drawn to our greed and our wickedness. Rod, please, said Jesse Felt in a whisper. We need to repent. We need... I think it was Sid that walloped him on the back of the head. Not hard enough to knock him unconscious, but with plenty of force to knock him over and shut him up. Fuck, I said and a few of us took a step back. Right away, Rashi knelt to tend to Rod, giving McNamara a sharp glare. Nobody else seemed to care. I don't know many animals that can survive being hit with eight pickaxes, said somebody whose name and face I can't recall now. Nine, by my count. It was Ralph. He didn't have to tell us the math that there weren't enough axes for everybody. 
Rod could barely walk, and Paul had a broken left arm, which left me and two others to fight with rocks. Sang was a little luckier. He kept this, uh, this special blade on him wherever he went. They call it a kerpan, and it's this longish dagger with all sorts of ornamentation. In the 50s, Appalachia, a knife wouldn't bother anybody. Shoot, back then it wasn't uncommon for a guy to walk through town with a six-shooter on his belt. None of us had a gun, of course, but I would have traded my rock for a good knife any day. Biggest threat here is going to be friendly fire. Who was the fellow that said that? I, I can't get his name. I remember his stories and that he'd been a sergeant in Korea... Damn, age is a hell of a thing. Anyway, the vet advised us a bit. Watch where you swing, but don't stop hitting it until it stops moving. And we quickly drew up a little battle plan with Sarge's help. Who'd approach from what angle, pairing up with battle buddies. The longer we waited, the more we feared we'd lose our nerve. That the creature hadn't made a sound for so long only added to our worries. Was it planning something? Was it even smart enough for plans? As a unit, we rounded the bend and shined our lanterns best we could. Half the standing lights were out, and the remainder were knocked over. Little strips of white shined in random directions like some sort of plaid pattern. But unless it was hiding in the shadows, no creature. Blood and gut trails told a story. The thing had drug the dead into the pirate's chest to feast. Hooper's leg was still pinned under the boulder, but there was no sign of the rest of him. No one was eager to be the first in line, so we crept towards what had to be the monster's lair real slow. Weapons raised. About halfway there, something dropped onto us, or rather, onto Sarge. We hadn't figured an attack from above, so the whole plan was shot. Half of us ran, half attacked, and I did a little of both. Now before I go farther, I'll try to describe the creature best I can. Just keep in mind, this was nearly 30 years ago. It moved faster than a rabbit, light was scarce, and I only ever got a real good look at it but once. At least with my eyes. Can't count how many times I've seen it in my dreams. But I suppose I saw it well enough for any man. I'm certain it was tall. How tall, I can't even guess, because it was bent over with the twistiest damn pretzel of a spine I ever did see. At least four legs, maybe twice as many arms, and at the end of each limb, there were a dozen fingers, or maybe they were antenna? Tentacles? Those spindly leg things on a shrimp? Shit, I don't know. I know it didn't have eyes. I remember that part well. It only had one thing on its head, the mouth, crossed between the tail of an earwig and a crocodile maw, but boy was it skinny. Too skinny for how strong it was, and the flesh, it, it didn't look so tough, translucent, almost worm-like. Fortunately for it, it had armor. Um, chitin. I think it's called, if it was a bug, but the plates intersected more like the shells of a crawfish. Any more description would be stretching the truth on my part, but whatever it was, insect, or crustacean, or demon, it tore the sergeant apart in just a couple seconds. I couldn't bring myself to charge in so close, so I threw my rock at its head. May as well have thrown a beach ball. Even the axe swings of hardened men weren't making cracks in the carapace. I grabbed the pick that Sarge had dropped, or had his hand been lopped off, I, I forget. Either way, I almost stepped in when the thing grabbed Ralph. I'd like to think that I would have helped if Rashi hadn't acted first. Sang stuck that holy dagger of his into the monster, easy as cut and cake. Your guess is as good as mine why it worked. Maybe the dagger was better quality iron than the picks, maybe something else, but the thing recoiled without making a sound, and Ralph was free. Lucky stab or not, two more bodies lay at the thing's feet, and there was nothing to do but run again. At least that's what everyone thought who wasn't Sid McNamara. 
in the ruckus he had managed to find and light a stick of dynamite. Keep your distance, boys, he shouted, running back to the fight. Now don't get any romantic notion that Sid was a martyr. I knew the man well as anybody and he had no intention of dying, just like he had no plan to slip on a pile of guts, twist his ankle too bad to stand, lose his grip on the explosive, and fail to catch the monster in the blast. All but one or two of us cleared the explosion, not counting Sid, who went out like everybody had guessed, but in circumstances an oracle couldn't have predicted. At least we were alive. Our eyes and ears were none too happy, but the monster seemed worse off, skittering around in random directions, tripping over itself. A sound-driven creature, blinded by the noise, maybe? It didn't even react to Rodney screaming for heaven to save him. We didn't have time to play guessing games or even grieve our friend's death. We had to leave. Ralph spotted our way out, and the chimney got blown open by the blast. We'd have to brave the middle of the room, praying the monster would avoid us with its random shuffles. And it would take two men to reach the opening, one on the shoulders of the other. But what choice did we have? So we went for it. I recall Jesse felt weeping as he climbed onto my back, and for a moment I judged him for it. Until I realized that I was crying too. To his credit... Felt found a ledge once through the opening and did his best to pull the rest of us up. Halfway through, Felt and Sang and a couple of others having reached safety, the monster grabbed someone. Matt Stewart, I, I believe. No one was there to watch him die and no one tried to help him. I confess feeling a bit of relief thinking that the catch would distract it long enough for us to climb. A sinful thought, sure, but... I definitely committed worse. Eight or nine of us were left, and of those, two had lanterns. We shined them upwards, and would you believe that we couldn't even see the roof? I, I don't know the odds of that. A passage appearing right above us. Straight shot, all the way up to the surface. Praise Jesus, we've been delivered, said Rod. And no one could really argue the point. We climbed, I don't know for how long. It was tiring work, but adrenaline is a powerful thing. At first we braced our backs to one wall and used our legs along the opposite, and then it turned into more like a steep slope and we had to scale with our hands. A few outcroppings gave us a chance to rest. Sometimes the mouth would widen and we could offer support to the weaker men, others it would narrow and we'd have to squeeze through one at a time. In one such shaft, we lost a man. A wide frame can be a blessing or a curse in a mine, and Liam was just too stout to fit, even with someone pushing from under and pulling from above. It didn't take long until Liam was wedged so tight he couldn't even go back down. He would have needed to break both his shoulders to move. Ralph offered to do just that, yank his arms out of their sockets, that is. And keep on climbing how? Liam asked. Then, still stuck, the man pulled out a pocket knife and cut his own throat. No, Rodney screamed, and all I could think was how fortunate that I was to be above him rather than below. It did take breaking his arms to dislodge his corpse. He didn't mind. He just fell ten feet before sticking someplace else. There would be time to pray for his soul later. We kept on for as long as we could, which wasn't that long. Now a few minutes later and we came across the worst thing any of us had ever seen, not counting the monster. The ceiling. On cue, one of the lanterns went out. It can't be, whispered Rodney. We're trapped. The odds of it coming out to the surface were always slim, said Ralph, no emotion in his voice. I just wish we had a few cigarettes to share. What, what time is it? I asked. I don't know why I asked that. Dark, probably, by now, said Ralph. Then they'll send somebody. Where Jesse's confidence came from, I can't say, but 
I am, Vida. Maybe there's already a rescue party digging through the rubble. We'll all be home by morning. Is that what you want, Phil? It was Ralph. All our friends and fathers getting themselves killed? No, of course not. Come on, Hatfield, I just mean... Shut up, said Ralph. And he did. No one said much anything for about the next hour. A few sobs, even a couple grim chuckles. I reckon the rest of us accepted the inevitable in that time. A small part of me held out hope for rescue. There was no way to warn the rescuers if anyone was coming. Nothing to do at all but wait and make peace with our creator. And then, at last, light went out. I doubt that you've ever experienced a dark like that one. Sure, maybe you've experienced pitch black, maybe you've even been underground, but I'm talking about the kind of dark that fills your insides, where even a pair of eyes three inches from yours don't glow. The kind of dark so deep you know you won't ever see light again. The little room we'd sat ourselves in felt an awful lot smaller all of a sudden, and the rocks scraping my back came harder to ignore. There's no one on this earth who I'd wish that sort of death upon, being buried alive. I would have traded anything just to stretch my arm out. In a way, it was almost like drowning. I had nearly drowned once, 12 years old, trying to impress Susan by swimming across a lake. It was fun at first until it hit me like a baseball bat how much water was between my feet and the lake's floor. I remember clearly how oppressive all that water felt as my head sunk under it. An older girl saved me then, and I, I didn't even have the wherewithal to be embarrassed by that. Dying underground was similar to that. All that stone above me and below me, and who knew how far it went. But no 11th grader was coming this time. Of all the things to reach out in mercy, it were the moon. Little stream of blue light above our heads. It took our eyes a bit to adjust to even make the light out. I, I, I thought that I was hallucinating until Felt shrieked in joy. The chimney did go all the way to the surface, but there was only a tiny slit, not near enough to scurry up. It was like Artemis herself was teasing us. That's the moon goddess, right? Right. I can do it, said Rashi. The hell you can, snapped Ralph. Hey, Rashi placed a hand on Ralph's cheek. I can do it. Have faith. Okay, said Rod. I have faith. Sang took off his boots and his jacket, spit on his palms, and steeled himself. Rashi, I said, I have faith too. I'll be back, he said, with a whole bunch of people. And guns, added Ralph. Rashi smiled. And guns. Before he left, he paused. Uh, I thought he was second-guessing himself, but then he handed me his knife. I thought your religion said you always had to carry this. Sang just laughed, and then up he went. We couldn't see him climb, mind. He blocked out all of the light, but we listened for minutes as he wiggled through the impossibly small opening. At some point, his grunts stopped and I feared that he had suffocated himself. But then he shouted down to us. I made it. I'll be back soon. There wasn't much conversation as we waited, but at least it no longer felt like drowning. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> done with drinking, I am done with gambling, I will never stray from my wife again, Rod prayed. Speak for yourself, said a fella I can't remember. First thing I'm doing when we get out of here is having a cold beer. Maybe three. A few of us laughed, a lot louder than the joke was funny, but then I heard it. Shh, I said, and everyone clammed up quick. The air wasn't quiet, though. We could all hear it. Liam's flesh, tearing, and then being swallowed. 
No, 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 Rodney said. We've been delivered. Why is it back? We were delivered. Sang's coming with guns, said Felt. He'll make it back fast. It took that thing a while to eat the poor fellows last time. We have some time. It had more than one body to eat last time, said Ralph. What if it finishes before Rashi returns, hmm? I'm not sure if I thought of it on my own or if it's what Ralph was trying to imply, but a way to buy us a few precious minutes crossed my mind. I didn't voice the plan, though. It was just too damn mean. And then Rodney voiced it for me. An offering, he said. That thing down there. It's a devil, a demonic spirit. We don't know that, said Ralph. Rodney continued. Oh, it's a demon if ever there was one. Demons are drawn to wickedness like moths to a flame. Someone brought it here, and only an offering will satisfy it. An evil offering for an evil thing. What are you trying to say, Rod? asked Jesse Felt. No one answered for a moment, but the silence was broken by a bone cracking, marrow being sucked. Monster was wrapping up with its meal. Maybe you're right, Rod, said Ralph. Maybe this devil has wanted a sacrifice all along. Come on, Ralph, you don't believe in that sort of superstition, said Jesse with something that may have been a chortle under different circumstances. Oh, I'm not sure what I believe anymore, Felt. But I know this thing's hungry. And I've got a pretty strong notion who the most wicked man is among us. I come from a long line of wicked folk. The next minute or two is a blur, probably because I've tried to block it out. But, like most everything I've tried in my life, I didn't do it well enough. Now, please understand. I... I don't remember laying a finger on felt, cross my heart, and swear on my children. The way I remember it, it is I stood back and watched. Even tried to reason with Ralph and the others to leave felt be. I've gone over it a thousand times in my head, maybe a hundred thousand, and I still don't remember myself as a murderer. But maybe the mind is more powerful than the soul, able to change memories that are too horrible to recall because... I do remember my knuckles stained in blood, half mine, half his. I remember looking at that thing's flat as a washboard face, the punches of a dozen men having removed any evidence of Felt's high cheekbones and pointed nose. I remember how he looked as white as marble in the moonlight, and I remember his screams, his why, why, and fellas, stop, please, fellas, and I remember when the words were replaced by pitiful gargles. Much worse than the creature. It's the memory that haunts me. I can forget it most days, but I remember every night. Whiskey helps a little. And that's how you know if the old-timer telling you the story was actually there. That's how you can be sure. Before we tossed the body down the hole, we nodded to each other in a silent pact not to tell a soul what happened. We weren't even supposed to talk about it with each other. That was the unspoken vow. So if somebody knows about Felt, they were there. No mistake. I've often wondered if I could have stopped it. I knew it was wrong, and I, I remember protesting some. I had the dagger, and I knew it didn't care for loud sounds. Could be if I was braver, I could have used the knife and the knowledge to fight the monster off, but it, if I'd stood in the way of the mob, would they have killed us both? No. Nah. However you cut it, I was a coward. Am a coward. I would have buckled for sure. I just wished Sang hadn't left for help. He wouldn't have let it happen. Rashi was a good man. 
made good on his word too, but the guns proved unnecessary. The rescue party never came across the creature coming straight back to the crag and digging us out. I'm guessing the monster left when it felt so many people milling around above us. But it wasn't in the mine when the town folks went back to recover what little was left of the corpses. Most of the survivors skipped town, moving with barely a goodbye to their friends and relatives they grew up with. One came back eventually, but the rest I never saw again. It was just as well. With the biggest mine shut down, there was less work. The owner of the mines talked about reopening a time or two, clearing the rubble. Most of the workers threatened to strike if he did. I had switched trades by then, spent the next 20 years in lumber. But the mine's still buried. The way I hear it, kids go up there sometimes, to the collapsed mine, see who's brave enough to hike in and touch the big cursed rock pile. Parents say it's dangerous. Cave-ins, rattlers and such. Grandparents say it's dangerous too, but for different reasons. It's still out there, somewhere. Maybe it's found another cavern to call home. Maybe it never much liked being underground, and now it lives in some forest. Before we came along, my guess is it was trapped, and we loosed it upon the world. I guess I'll never know. Not sure that I'd want to. I'll be dead soon. In a box or an urn. Maybe Rasha had the right of it. Buried things have a tendency not to stay buried. I'd have myself burned too, if it wouldn't cause an uproar in the church. <laughs> Funny. Why should I care? Probably stepped inside that building less than a hundred times and those just for weddings and funerals and Easter Sundays. There'd be a scandal all the same. I never made much trouble alive. I figure no use in starting after I die. Telling you the story, the whole story, even the worst bits, that's my kind of penance. People should know what's out there in the dark as much as they should know what we did. On Judgment Day, when I have to look felt in the eye and make an account of how I've lived, the things I've done, at least I can say I told it like it happened. Not until the end, of course. I guess I kept quiet about my sins during the golden years. So if the good judge sees fit to damn me, well, I, I guess I can't protest too much. Maybe in whatever hell I'm headed for, I'll meet that creature again. Yeah, that's kind of the trade-off for having really good stories. The best ones often come from the worst experiences. So stay scary, wildlings. Here's hoping your best tales are the ones you make up, not the ones you regret. And make the most of your nights. <laughs> <laughs>